Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. We've got a couple of great topics lined up for you tonight, starting with Microsoft released their digital defense report just a couple of weeks ago on October 7th. And as I was reading through this, there were a lot of points that I thought were important to bring up because if you hadn't had a chance, and we'll of course link to it in our show notes, but we'll kind of go over a summary of some of the key points and takeaways from that tonight. So first and foremost, looping back to our very first episode of the blue security podcast if you have not listened to it or you know there's no need to go back and listen to it but one of the points that we had brought up was whether or not organizations should geofence or geo restrict their ip addresses from their corporate networks in a sense of like should you prevent your corporate network from getting ips from russia or should you prevent north korea ips from getting into your corporate network. And we had a couple of points there that we thought maybe, you know, it wasn't worth it. Maybe because there are technologies today which easily allow you to circumvent a geo restriction. But the very first thing in this digital defense report was that 58% of all cyber attacks observed by Microsoft come from Russia. And they weren't the only nation state, but they were certainly the the largest share of attacks that were coming from a single nation state. And not only that, their effectiveness jumped. So the, the attackers from Russia, the effectiveness of their attack rates increased from 21% to 32%. Among Russia was other countries like North Korea, which was number two, at 23%, Iran at number three at 11%, China at eight, and then falling down to South Korea, Vietnam, and Turkey at about less than 1% of representation. So as you can see, Russia was the largest pool. So in my mind, I was thinking about this and kind of going back to what we had talked about over a year ago now, Adam, whether or not countries, sorry, corporations should geo-restrict their network traffic. And I thought... Well, if you don't have any locations or you don't have any company data or you don't have any dealings with people from Russia, then wouldn't it be a good mitigation of risk by going ahead and geo-restricting IPs from those countries? I didn't think it would hurt anything. That was just, you know, I know that there's ways to circumvent it, but... In my mind, I was just thinking about it just to try to justify it. And I was, if I was at a company that I was in charge of that policy, I'd almost say based on this report, it would be a good idea, especially if you didn't have any dealings with anyone from the Russian Federation to go ahead and geo restrict those IPs. What do you think? So, two things. Number one, on this digital defense report, you know, a lot of cybersecurity companies will come out and say, oh, hey, we've got this new report. It's great. Come to our website and come get it. And you go to their website and you click, give me the report. And then it wants a whole bunch of information about you and your job and your email address. And then they're going to spam you and people, salespeople are going to call you. Just so you know, with this Microsoft Digital Defense Report, when you go pull this up and get to the landing page, there's a link that says get the report. That does not take you to a form. It takes you directly to the PDF. So just want to clarify for our listeners, like we've all heard cybersecurity companies offer like great documentation and white papers and reports, and they're always behind like a a wall um, (laughs) where there's going to be sales and marketing people coming out to get you after you try to access it. This is just straight up accessible. You click it, you get a PDF done. So just want to clarify that for our listeners that this is absolutely something you can go view without getting hassled by Microsoft salespeople like me and Andy (laughs) um, for it. So definitely check it out. Now onto the point at hand here with the geo restriction. And the funny thing is we did that show now over a year ago. I don't remember where I landed on that. I think Andy, both you and I were kind of like, well, 
you know, an attacker worth their salt is going to VPN anyways, so it's not going to really do you any good. And, you know, you can if you want. And and that's kind of still where I come down, right? In general, as as we talk through cybersecurity, I think one of the messages we frequently land on this show is that concept of like when you're being chased by insert wild animal here, you don't have to be faster than that animal. You just have to be faster than the slowest person kind of thing. It's that increasing attack cost until you're no longer an attractive target and some other organizations more attractive, right? So we're all trying to not be the slowest essentially um, in this giant game of ransomware and, and monetization. If you are too much work to monetize, then they'll go to somebody who's easier. And Doing something like this, like if you have no dealings there, and especially if it's a country where, I mean, to be honest, um, the Russian Federation is not a top tourist attraction for American tourists at this point. Um, I mean, what's the harm, right? But just don't go to bed like sleeping like, ah, I have solved the problem. Those 58% of cyber attacks from nation states are no longer, we're, we're immune to them now. Like, Nobody listening to this show thinks that way, but make sure your leadership doesn't think that way either if you put a restriction like that in place. And then just do be aware, like if you if you do put in mitigations like this, there's always going to be someone who then like makes a trip there and gets all bent out of shape that like, why can't I sign and get my email from insert location X? So consider, you know, what is, and, and we always talk about this on the show, when you put in a mitigation, you're almost always going to get asked for a workaround for VIP or for specific scenario X or whatever. So have that planned out ahead of time. Don't be caught flat footed when your CFO goes to a trip to St. Petersburg and then wonders why they can't read their email, right? Have a plan in place ahead of time before that happens, because somebody's not going to call down necessarily to IT and say, hey, I'm making this trip. Is everything copacetic with me heading out there? Uh, you're not going to get that heads up. You're going to get the call in the middle of the night after the fact. So don't be trying to figure that out at 2 a.m. Very good points. The other thing that I saw in the report was that password based attacks are still the main source of identity compromise. Azure Active Directory sees about 50 million password attacks daily and reported in this report is that 20% of all Microsoft users have MFA enabled and 30% of global admins have MFA enabled, which leaves a huge gap for folks who don't. And if you're a listener of the show and you're a practitioner of information security, you know that MFA is required these days as a form of mitigation against identity compromise. We're going to keep hammering it because obviously based on the data that we have here, there's still a bunch of users who don't have MFA enabled. There's a bunch of companies who don't have MFA enabled. So, you know, more data to kind of sell the case just in case you're one of those organizations out there that doesn't have MFA enabled. This is concrete data that Microsoft sees that just in our tenants alone, this is not part of any other identity provider, which I'm sure is you know probably going to see the same similar spread of data in their tenants. You should probably use this data to try to implement MFA if you haven't done it at your organization. Those are stunning numbers. Like I just had to take a deep breath there. Just 20% of users, 30% of global admins. What? That is bananas. You know, we used to work with this gentleman at Microsoft. He, he now has moved on to another organization. Uh, but, but one of my favorite identity, I, I guess, kind of an engineer. He was more in like product group management. A gentleman by the name of Daniel Stefaniak, who I believe has listened to the show from time to time. So, hey, Daniel, what's up if you're listening? And one thing Daniel would famously do is he'd walk into a customer and write his password on, like, the whiteboard. And that's because at at Microsoft, the way we're configured, which, again, is not the end-all, be-all, but it, it is a highly attacked organization, there are multiple levels of additional controls in place above and beyond just password. Like you have somebody's password at Microsoft, big freaking deal. Do you have a managed device in the Microsoft environment? Do you have a second factor 
that can pass second factor authentication? No. Well then good luck, you know, kind of thing. And obviously that's a little aggressive thing to do. And you know, I guess I'll never really know if he's really writing down his real password, but it, it proves the point that you should pretty much be to the point when if your password gets compromised, you kind of shrug your shoulders and say, oh, well, obviously go change it. But like in and of itself, the password's not enough to get to something. You know, I think of to use a, a kind of analogy. I once had a user. I, I used to manage an email environment for a um multi-state insurance company based in West Des Moines. And I once had a user open a ticket and they were upset that they were getting lots of junk email in their junk email folder in Outlook. Like I I'll say that again, they were upset. They were getting a lot of junk email in their junk email folder. And I was, and I, you know, my response was, well, well, the system's doing what it's supposed to do. It's detecting that it's junk and it's putting it in the junk email folder. And they're like, yeah, but I just don't, you know, I just don't want to see it all together kind of thing. And we've kind of run into organizations right now where they still like get their hair on fire when like, Hey, a password got compromised. And like your attitude should be, if a password gets compromised, well, you had two factor enabled, right? And that stopped the bad guys, right? Okay. That's why you have second factor. Like why have MFA? Why have a junk email folder? If your expectation is you never want it used right? The whole reason you have that second factor is that failback that when somebody breaks your first factor, they didn't get in. That's the reason it's there. That's when it does its job. If you never have a password get compromised, then you don't need 2FA, but passwords get compromised all the time. So you need that. So this is just, this is just bonkers to me. And with that volume of password attacks too, my goodness, like uh password spray, you know, password stuffing, credential stuffing, like the, the bad guys are out there. They're, they're poking for holes. They're looking for weaknesses. And if you're not, you know, there, there's lots you can do to try to help with your passwords. But if you're not doing that second factor, you're never going to win that fight. So do it. And I, and I'd be willing to bet our listeners, Andy, anybody who's listened to this show long enough, they're in that 20 and 30% respectively. I, I, I think our listeners were preaching to the choir here, but if you can spread the gospel, when you talk to your peers and when you talk to other organizations, please do that. I, it, it, where are these organizations? Where are I just, ah, I can't even find words here. Yeah, exactly. So one of the people quoted in this article is Brett Arsenal, who is the CISO for Microsoft. And he also said something in here that we have often said, but uh, it's worth repeating he quote, as he said, and I quote, I do sometimes worry that people think until they can get to 100%, they don't move on each different segment. And so what he's basically conveying here is a lot of people don't try to implement something unless they can get everyone on board or everyone implemented. And sometimes that's the case with like MFA. You're like, well, I'm not going to be able to get everyone. And what about my service accounts? And what about, you know, my users who are in the sales floor and they can't have their phones or something like that? Well, you can start small. You can start with your privileged users. You can start with your sensitive users, your C-suite, your HR folks, your engineering, your finance, you know, people who have access to sensitive data, sensitive uh, processes for the company. Start with that. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, everyone at once. That usually happens after a breach, which is, you know, shotgun turn on MFA for everybody. But, you know, hopefully you have it turned on before then. And if you haven't and you're worried or someone's telling you, hey, we can't start this. We don't have the manpower to start it. Well, just start somewhere and start with your IT folks. Start with your admins. Um, you don't have to do everyone overnight. So, I think that's a really good point that he made that we've also made before. And uh, I'll just kind of drive it home one more time here. And to be really, really fair to Brett, and I, I adore his work. Um, I have to say, you know, kind of two things about Brett Arsenault. Number one, when I came in, I, I've worked for other very large tech companies before. I worked for IBM. I worked for Apple. And both of them had extremely heavy handed 
in your face, user hostile security, like really, really painful places to work. I work for a publicly traded financial group, um, downtown Des Moines, heavy handed in your face security. It was really, really painful. I worked for one of the largest annuities providers in the United States in West Des Moines, heavy handed in your face security. Like, so I've, I've lived that life and I knew because Microsoft very famously is one of the largest, most attacked organizations in the world. I figured when I came here, it was going to be more like that, you know, really locked down, really security conscious, like everything was really painful and really hard to do. And, you know, bureaucracy and, and so much just garbage. And it is stunning, like absolutely stunning, like the amount of freedom and, and ability to get your work done in a way where security is kind of invisible at this organization. It's stunning. It is possible. It, it proves that you can be a secure org if you make the right choices and commit to them and you don't have to do it in a way that's user hostile and like user unfriendly and like hurts, hurts productivity. It is, it is stunning. I have never, and I mean, never worked for a large tech company like this one that has a more user-friendly kind of experience. It's really stunning. And Brett deserves all of the credit for spearheading and leading the security organization at Microsoft. Second point about him is he is not a cheerleader for any Microsoft like sales organization. Absolutely not. Brett's job is to secure Microsoft and he's going to use the best tool for the job. And so there are examples from time to time that make the sales organization get grumpy that he is not using a tool internally yet. And they're like, Hey, how can I go sell this if we don't even use it? Well, first off, don't volunteer that information. But secondly, like his job isn't to be a, a sales mouthpiece. It's to secure the org. And so when Brett says something, anything, you can really take it to the bank that like he believes that's the best way to secure the company. So I'll give you an example. In 2016, Microsoft released a password guidance document and it, pretty much has stayed pretty static since then. So five years now have passed and NIST adopted almost all the same concepts that Microsoft did in this, this kind of groundbreaking research document that came out again, five years ago, back in 2016. And it said things that at the time were kind of eyebrow raising, like you should not have complexity requirements, like stop requiring uppercase, lowercase number symbol. It said you should stop expiring passwords on and on and on, you know, don't have history or requirements. And anyhow, Microsoft released this as like a research article that said, everybody should do this. Well, did Microsoft security do that right away? No, they didn't. They did not implement that right away. So when I joined Microsoft in March of 2017, personally, my password still expired every 90 days, even though we had released a document the year before that said you shouldn't expire passwords. We weren't even doing it yet. And then Brett kind of extended it out and said, okay, it's a year now. And so we had passwords expire every year. And then eventually, yes, we did move to the point that passwords no longer expire. So I've now had the same user password at Microsoft for multiple years now that I've been there once we stopped expiring passwords altogether. Um, but that's been a, a process where again, like Brett is not beholden to any other part of the company. He, he wants to protect it. So when he says things like this and you really, really take it to the bank of, of a guy who has protected a company really, really well, but done it in a way that's really as invisible as possible and really as productivity and user friendly as possible. And so Andy, you started with the quote and I'm going to finish Brett's quote, continuing on quote. We can do more as an industry to continue to help people see, start with 2FA, start with the high risk users relative to your business. There are different starting points for different businesses and different models. Pick the ones that are most important for your business." End quote. And that's just perfect, right? That's exactly what Andy and I kind of bang the drum on this show about all of the time is just start somewhere, just do something. Incremental improvement is still improvement. And get out of this mindset that if we can't do all of it, we're not going to do any of it. And again, I think our listeners are some of the brightest and best in security, and they know this already. But any way you can share, again, the gospel with your peers at other orgs, or maybe other of the more curmudgeonly types at your own company and get them to see the light, you know, please do that because we're all trying to, to fight the good fight here.
I've heard Brett speak before as well, and it's always a pleasure listening to him. And he actually told the story of when he was making that decision of transitioning from a 90-day password expiration to a one-year password expiration to a no pa- expiration. And he said that he wanted to go from the 90-day right to the no expiration, but the higher-ups told him, well, if something goes wrong, you're going to own it, and you know that's basically going to be your job. And he was like, well, I'm pretty sure... But I'm not like 100% sure. So we'll just go out to a year. So he he compromised and actually went out to a year. And then after a year, you know, the sky didn't fall. And that's when they dropped the expiration date. So when you were talking about, you know, that user experience, there was another report that I read that was also interesting where consumers and users these days of technology want security to be there but they want it to be invisible they want it to be behind the scenes they don't want it in your face so when you're thinking about these security features that you're trying to implement you know i think nowadays it's starting to make a turn towards you know what's the user experience like and so you know this report talked about how you know 89% of people that were surveyed in the 2021 Global Identity Fraud Report by Experian uh, talked about wanting physical biometrics uh, like fingerprints and facial scans as their preferred method of authentication. So that was like number one. So they want that seamless, you know, not having to enter in anything, just use my fingerprint, use my facial scan. Number two was behavioral biometrics, which basically looks at passively... Um, observe signs between you know your mobile devices basically the heuristics right so uh, for example you know we have identity protection in our azure ad where it's looking at where you're signing in from what device you're signing in from and so all those things will have like a risk score of some sort they want that where they're not actually just looking at anything or they're not putting in anything to authenticate they're just hoping that the security on the back end the intelligence will tell them whether or not you're secure and be able to authenticate them that way the pin um, being sent to their phones was surprisingly number three, and nowhere on that list was passwords. In fact, passwords was like 57% of people uh, thought that you know they preferred passwords as a method of authentication. So there's still some people who feel comfortable with passwords, but by and large, most people want that seamless experience, right? Passwordless. So... You know, look at passwordless solutions. We've talked about it like Windows Hello for Business for authenticating to Windows or like the fingerprint and biometrics for your MDM policy. I remember reviewing one of my company's policies for an M&A that we had uh, acquired. And when I was trying to match up our two MDM policies to try to keep them similar, uh, one of the things that they prevented was the biometrics on a Mac computer. So they were using Jamf for MDM. And one of the things that you can prevent that Apple has, you know, like a fingerprint reader on their new Mac Pros. Or I, I'm not sure if they have them now on their new ones, but they, there was a version of them that had them on there. They actually prevented biometrics from being used. And I was like, why would you do that? That's not only user convenience, but it's also security. You know, it's the same technology that's being used on your iPhone. So if you're not preventing that, then why would you prevent it on a Mac? So don't lock out solutions that will make it easier just because you're afraid that it might not be as secure when in fact there's a lot of security that goes into these solutions. We have passwordless solutions with Microsoft as far as Azure AD goes and you know, they're just as secure, if not more secure, than using a password in a second factor. So think about that as you're trying to implement your security solutions. Make sure that the user experience is not degraded to a point that it's not going to be a good experience for them, right? They want the, the easy method for authentication. I think Apple deserves a ton of credit for normalizing biometric authentication here. And I'm not, you know, don't email me and tell me Android did it first or anything like that. I don't, I don't really care because I, I think as, as far as I'm concerned, like Apple was the first implementation that was really good, like really reliable and Apple with their intense focus on user privacy 
did a very good job of making people comfortable with the implementation of it. Because even most non-technical people, I think, even though they can't tell you the technology behind it, and there's a ton, I think most of them would say they're reasonably comfortable that like touch ID and face ID on iPhone are, are protecting their privacy in some way. And initially there was hesitance on it. I remember again, going back to that multi-state insurance company I worked for, one of the job functions I performed was I delivered new corporate owned iPhones to people and I had secured a, you know, great deal with Verizon or something to like trade in all our old phones and like replace all of them with iPhone success which shipped with a fingerprint reader and um, well, iPhone six did too. So I guess it doesn't matter, but anyhow, and it was, as I would go to people's desk and like help them configure it. I remember at the time when it was still pretty new, like having to be delicate around the idea of configuring your fingerprint to sign in because a lot of people weren't comfortable with it. And so I had to have a talk track in place where I could explain briefly, like this is only on your device. We can't see it. There is no, you know, it's not like a fingerprint in there. It's math. Essentially, it can't be reconstructed back into anything, blah, 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 blah. But there was some hesitance. And I don't see that today. Like you do not run into anybody outside of people like really wackadoodle tinfoil hat folks who don't use biometrics on like their mobile device anymore because they understand like this is way faster and way more secure than typing in my password or pin that could get shoulder surfed or something anyway, you know, and so give Apple a ton of credit there. And, and I'm, I have to say, I'm shocked. Like that number is high, just like those MFA numbers were low 89%. I, I, that's pretty darn good. I am surprised that people are so on board with it. And I thought the second one was interesting because I don't think most people could articulate like behavioral based kind of metrics or biometrics for, for, you know, identity proofing or whatever you're doing, but even though people might not be able to articulate it, they're familiar with it because their credit cards do it all the time. And, you know, one interesting exercise, and Andy, you've probably been through this, is when you get, say, a new Apple device and you go to set up all of your new um, Apple Pay on it, like put all your credit cards back in it. It is so interesting because I've got credit cards from several different issuers, how some of them will just let me sign in. Some of them will send me a pin. Some of them like want a phone call. Some of them want this, some of them want that. And it's random, like which ones will just let me go straight through setup and which ones will prompt me for more information because credit card companies kind of invented this concept of behavioral baselining of your activity and then flagging activity that's abnormal. They, it, when we used to talk about like Azure AD identity protection, I would give that analogy to your credit card. Like, oh, if you go shopping where you usually shop, you're never going to get flagged for fraud. But the moment you go do something weird, like you, you get on an airplane and go somewhere and do something completely out of character for you, you might get flagged. And it's like it, it had a behavioral baseline and you kind of went outside of it. And that's also how they catch fraud is, is like impossible travel and all that. They're doing all those same sorts of things we do with identity to protect against card fraud. And I, I think that's just really fascinating that consumers have a concept of that, right? And, and where I'm going with all of this is oftentimes I will get pushback from IT that they don't want to do something because like, oh, well, our users don't know how to do that. Like there is, and this is the most toxic mindset in IT, and I hate it, hate it, is disrespecting your users and thinking they are lesser than they are. People today have technology in all of their lives all of the time. So gone are the days when we should assume that like users are completely unsophisticated, have no idea how to do anything. Anything more complicated than like a Fisher price toy is too much for them. And the way we solve that is by handing them reams of documentation. Like I reject all of those concepts completely. One of the things that I have always liked, and I've probably cited this on the show before, but I'll say it again. When you buy an iPhone, it does not come with a big, thick instruction manual in the box. It comes with like a little pamphlet that tells you like where the switches are. Like, here's how you turn it on. Like, here's the volume, you know, here's how you answer a phone call. And that's like it. Like past that, it's, you know, go figure it out. Have fun. Explore. Learn through exploration like we all did when we were children. And that's the right approach because the moment you ship a manual with it, then there is the underlying message that this requires a manual to operate. 
And that's the same thing here where IT will like assume like, oh, people can't figure out biometrics or people can't figure out how to do MFA. Like they and it always gets pointed out like people do MFA for their banks now. People do that all the time. Like Apple ID, Apple Gates, everything cool with Apple ID behind MFA today. You cannot do all sorts of cool stuff like unlock your Mac with your Apple Watch. Can't do it if you don't have MFA on your account. Um, you want to set up like uh, family sharing? Yeah, you need MFA turned on. You want to do this? Need MFA. Apple won't let you do anything without it. So like this whole concept is so insulting to users that they can't figure this stuff out. And I think this proves it, right? Users understand better than IT that passwords are garbage. Like users get that, like Joe, Joe six pack. So this just proves more than anything. This is more fuel for the fire. You need to move to biometrics, windows flow for business. You need to move to passwordless technologies as fast as you can. And you need to start using instead of static factors for your authentications, like, Oh, what location are you signing in from? What IP range are you signing in from? Uh, how about instead, like, are you signing from an IP range I've seen you from before? That's way more valuable than like, here's a static set of trusted IPs, you know? Oh, well, I've seen you sign in from that Starbucks before. I've seen you sign in from your house before. You're cool. Hey, what, what's this? You just traveled somewhere weird and I've never seen you sign in from here before. And, and you're on a different device than I've seen you on before. Like red flag, red flag. Like, let's check this out. That's how you do it today. And, and you know what users are telling us from this experience survey? That's what they expect. So... I'll get off my soapbox on that one, but this was just so interesting. And Andy, I'm so glad you flagged this because what great conversation here for our listeners to hear that consumers expect some of this next generation technology as far as how they use their, their services and, and interact with technology. So this next one, if you like that last one, this next one's going to be fun too. <laughs> I saw a tweet that I'll read verbatim for you. Just found out that a director at a former employer of mine ripped out an InfoSec tool that was vital to how the org's defenses worked. He ripped it out because it wasn't on the Gartner Magic Quadrant. Stuff like this is why defense teams are constantly losing. And I saw this tweet and I was like, oh boy, this is some fuel for our podcast to talk about because we've mentioned it before. Having something in there, you know, Adam and I are very transparent. We are part of Microsoft. We sell security tools for Microsoft. We are technologists as far as understanding the Microsoft stack. But I'm not going to say, you know, if you don't have our tools in and you have a competitor's tools, rip those out and not have anything at all. I would much rather you have one of our competitors' tools, right? Symantec, CrowdStrike, Okta, Ping, whatever it is that you're using as far as your security stack, as far as your identity stack goes, and you're using MFA, like having that in there is better than not having it at all. So the fact that if you're using a tool and it's not on the magic quadrant for Gartner and you rip it out because that's the reason, I think that's insane. Like Gartner is a is a data point. It's a one blip of your decision that you should reference, but it is not the end all be all, you know, there's so many different categories. There's so many different, um, criterias for each one of the softwares that they rank. And I'll give you one example. When I was at my previous company, we were looking at a PAM solution, privileged access management. And if you look at the Gartner Quadrant for PAM, there's only one thing in the upper quadrant, and that's CyberArk. Everyone knows it's CyberArk, right? CyberArk's the only one in town. They've been around for years. They're the only one in the upper quadrant. Everyone also knows that CyberArk is a beast to put in. If you've been at an organization who uses CyberArk, you know that every time they come out with a new version, it requires professional services in order to upgrade. It is ridiculously heavy handed heavy just as far as it legacy tools it is just a beast you know tons of different servers sql databases i mean it's massive to maintain so we looked at a different solution because we were a stealth bits customer and they had a brand new pam solution and i'll say that this pam solution while 
it was very lightweight, you know, it was very new. It did not have some of the features that maybe CyberArk did, but that was okay. You know, what do you really need when it comes to a PAM solution? You know, it satisfied those requirements. And it kind of redefined the PAM category, kind of like how Azure Sentinel redefined the SIM category, you know, as far as those legacy SIMs that have been around a long time, whereas Azure Sentinel is all in the cloud. Their PAM solution, StealthBits PAM solution was all in the cloud, didn't really require any you know, major infrastructure. I think it required one service, one server, um, and that's pretty much it. So because it was a new service and because it didn't meet some of the PAM criteria that Gartner had put out, it actually wasn't on the Gartner Quadrant at all. And I don't think it ever really was going to make it because they were really trying to redefine the category. You know, it was something that we had seriously considered. I left the company before we actually made a pick for something, but it was in the running because it was lightweight to implement. It was pretty much everything that you wanted in a PAM solution. So again, we considered Gartner. We talked to Gartner. We even had a call about PAM and they basically told us, you know, like CyberArk is the best one. We're like, okay, it's super expensive. It'll take like a year to implement. And then every time you want to upgrade, it's going to cost you, you know, whatever, $60,000 in professional services. So, you know, take that for what you will. I mean, Gartner is a good reference, but it is not the end-all be-all. And if you rip out a, a solution based on that, I think it's it's pretty insane. I have an interesting relationship with Gartner. So... I've been at Microsoft long enough now that in the early days of our security kind of sales process, if you will, a lot of our tools were not recognized on the Gartner MQs at all, or they were scored lowly. Same with Forrester Waves, by the way. We're kind of treating those all as equivalent here. And over time, that was held against us enough that we decided to make a concerted effort to move up the Gartner MQs and the Forrester Waves. And so today, just to be clear, like Microsoft is really good at this now. We're in the farthest upper right, usually like farthest along at least one axis in five Gartner MQs and six Forrester Waves now. So like from an IT analyst perspective, Microsoft does really well with this. So um, I, I, at one point in time, was selling against those saying, you know, it's one data point, but it's not the end all be all. And now it's like, Hey, look at this data point right here. Looking pretty good. Right. So it, but, but either way, you, you know, when we are on the bottom of it and customers held it against us. And now when we've done well in it, customers say, well, who cares? It's not that big a deal. Or they do worse, which is something that is really frustrating. And they'll say like, essentially accuse us of bribing our way onto the MQ, which I think is ridiculous, but and rude and and don't do that to your security vendors because that's that's actually really 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 like bad accusation because you're accusing them of being um non-ethical you know unethical and that's that's a big accusation to accuse somebody's employer your employer is unethical like do you walk around and say that to people because that's really rude so anyhow i don't mean to get on a tangent here but that's been said to me before and it's it, it's hurtful um Anyhow, yeah, I mean, obviously, like, don't, if you're going to replace a solution, that's fine. Don't just rip something out to rip something out, right? That's, that's a different thing. And, you know, the language of this tweet could be deceptive because maybe, and, and maybe Andy, I, I didn't do the conversation. Maybe the author clarified that it was a swap out and not a rip out. Like there's, there's not just a, a hole sitting there, but. I, and Andy, in our pre-show, we talked about this a little bit too. And I, I quoted another product that's not on an MQ. It's Jamf, right? And anybody who knows anything about Mac management is going to be like, well, Jamf's the best. You know, clearly uh, their entire Mac suite of products, whether it's, you know, Jamf Pro, the Mac management platform, Jamf Connect, the identity solution for integration with different identity providers, like they're all phenomenal products. They're not on a Gartner MQ. So like... I mean, you're, you're going to manage Max, you're going to use like VMware because they're on the Gartner MQ. Like, give me a break. I mean, that's ridiculous. Like, go get Champ. It's it's good. Or at least look at something new and interesting like Kanji. But like, it, it's it's one of those funny things, you know, of it can be a data point. It can influence your decision. You can use it to look at here's where we should maybe 
spend some of our time talking to these vendors and doing these POCs. Sure. But you still have to look at what's right for you. And, and here's another thing to consider as well. And Gartner's very open about this. Like this is not like a dirty little secret. One of the major factors in Gartner positioning is how widely deployed a product is. So they'll talk about that. They'll be like, oh, well, you know, if you read the Gartner MQ for say access management, which I have because anyhow, we'll save the insults for later. Uh, they'll, they'll knock Okta, for example, because they'll say like, well, their, their customer footprint's mostly based in North America. So they don't really have a worldwide footprint. You know, and then of course, Microsoft always does well in that because like Microsoft has a, you know, broad and deep customer base across the globe. And so what happens is you get this virtuous cycle where a product gets popular and then it moves up the Gartner MQ and then more people buy it because based in part, it's positioning is a lot of people use it. It's that old adage of nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Like Nobody ever got fired for buying CyberArk kind of thing, you know, like it's, it's the safe play, but Hey, let's push the rewind button for a second. And let's go back to that Microsoft digital defense report about the Russian nation state actors. So they were 21% successful a year ago and they're 32% successful this year. So we're trending in the wrong direction on our ability to repel sophisticated attacks, which remember that kind of wackadoodle article from a professor Gwyn. I think he was at SMU and it was like best, uh, best practices are BS. You shouldn't follow best practices. And, and I said, you know, a lot of what he was getting at was maybe phrased the wrong way or was phrased in a way to be kind of attention grabbing. But I think the underlying message there that like, if you just are doing the same thing as everybody else, like, and that's, that's this, you know, generally accepted best practices, we're all going to go be best of breed. And we're going to buy the upper right Gartner MQ thing. And, you know, we'll figure out integration later. And then LOL, just kidding. We'll never integrate anything like that strategy is, is I think we're getting enough data to say, maybe that's not the right solution anymore. Maybe there is a play where we need to consider, like, again, if you're not going to buy, like, all of a security vendor solutions, like their entire platform, at least have some strategic integration where it makes sense. One I might suggest would be like identity and endpoint. Those go together like peas and carrots, like Forrest and Jenny. You know, those are one of those things like you got to look at where it makes sense to do some sort of integration here. So I think Gartner's been good to me in, in my career. So I, I don't want to like completely poo poo it, but at the same time, it is just one data point and you've got to find the right solution for you and your org. And think about this and any given MQ, there's only going to be like two, three, four, you know, upper right leaders in that space, but there are a ton. And I mean, a ton of folks out there selling cybersecurity solutions. So that proves to me there is money out there to be made. Even if you're not in the leaders quadrant. There is money to be made. There are good quality solutions that really smart people did their due diligence, did a pilot, did a POC and said, you know what? That's the right solution for us. And who cares where they're positioned on the Forrester wave? So they, if like that was the only right answer, then you wouldn't have these tons and tons and tons of security vendors in existence today because they couldn't stay afloat. And so there's at least some organizations that look at different solutions and, you know, yours should too. Yeah. That kind of triggered another thought in my head. Cause you know, not that you want to always have security through obscurity, but you know, maybe if you're like the one person who's doing something different and you have a solar winds type event where everyone is using solar winds, but you're not, you know, mm -hmm. you're not affected type deal. Right. Um, <laughs> And, hey, remember the movie know, the, the Net when everyone was on the same like firewall solution? I forget what it was called in, in it. And you know, they they kept getting, of course, they had a back door in it, it turns out, but they kept saying, like, well, they were protected with this, you know, vendor's firewall and Pegasus poof, poof. or something like that. Yeah, something like that, like Pegasus firewall, and yet they kept all getting attacked, like, hmm, you know, there's th that's an interesting point. So not not suggesting again, and I guess that was kind of foreshadowing of solar winds, wasn't it? Um, but, but in reality, you know, that 
that shouldn't be the sole basis of your decision making, but that is a good point, right? Like if, as we've talked through this show tonight, we talked about like increasing attack cost, you know, making your organization unattractive to attackers. Well, I'll tell you what's going to make it really darn attractive is if you run like the most common technical stack and you don't enable MFA, it's like Candyland for those attackers. They get in there, you know, it's like, geez, I just had to, you know, password stuff or password spray, single factor authentication broke in. And look, what do you know? It's like the most common tech stack in the world. And by the way, it's not patched or updated. And so there's like a bajillion vulnerabilities for this thing. And I know how to get in there and and you run amok, right? Because they had previous version of CyberArk, which has this vuln in it, and they didn't update it because it takes professional services. LOL, best of breed, you know? Like, <laughs> it's just, I, I, I got to calm down here, but this has been a good conversation for sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not that I haven't used Gardner before. I think, you know, they're a good company. They put out good information. Um, the way that this tweet was written was that it wasn't just a uh, replacement of a product. It was because the person who ripped it out thought it wasn't any good and wasn't doing anything because it wasn't on the Gardner Quadrant. So, you know, I've used Gartner when it comes to something that I may not be familiar with, like, you know, um, a network security uh, detection and response, right? Like, uh, like a dark trace or... Um, extra hop, Vectra. I mean, there's a lot of vendors in that security space and, you know, a lot of them kind of do similar things, but, you know, getting just some feedback on Gartner and seeing which ones are, you know, trending in the industry, where the difference in capabilities are. Um, when we talked to them about Pam, you know, they did point out some other companies, but in the end they were like, yeah, you know, CyberArk is good. Like you said, like no one's going to get fired if they buy CyberArk as a Pam solution, but, you know, there were some drawbacks. So, you know, use it as a grain of salt. And certainly, you know, just because it's not on there doesn't mean it's not doing anything. It's it's something, you know, that is a layered security thing in your organization. There's no reason to rip it out if it's not compromised or it's not a malicious tool. So it was gatekeeper was the, the firewall on the net by gatekeeper. Yeah. yeah. Greg Microsystems, and then uh, Sandra Bullock's character worked for Cathedral Software. That was a great movie. <laughs> One of the good I, ones. I, I was using a um, total, total random side note, but this was a delightful little Easter egg. I have been using the um, app called Beeper which is like attempts to be a modern, like bring all your chat networks together in one app kind of thing, including iMessage. And it actually kind of works, which is cool. Um, but I was in the setting screen and there was a little pie in the lower right corner. Of it. I was like, that is awesome. What a great Easter egg. And when you hovered over it, it gave you like a whole bunch of debug information, but I'm like, that is the best Easter egg of all time. So nice. speaking of references to that movie, I just had one the other day in real life. I want to pause here for a second and give us a, a cut. Um, do you want to just leave out this next one for maybe some other show? Because we're, I think we're at like 50, some, you know, probably like 40 some minutes yeah, of let's the call show. It. Let's call it. Okay. Well, we had a great conversation this week. That's our show. Thanks as always for listening. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have questions about the show or have topics that you want us to talk about. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.